Hebrews, you guys, this is one of the few books of the New Testament that we don't, um, the authorship's kind of cloudy. That originally it was, people thought that Hebrews was written by Paul, but within the last 200 years, scholarship is like overwhelming that Paul did not write that. Well, Doc, Doc Adams here has a theory on possibly who the author of Hebrews was. He doesn't identify himself, which is one of the reasons people don't think it's Paul. Because Paul, in every letter, identifies himself, you know, from Paul, an apostle, to the churches at Galatia. So, your theory. Yeah, Apollos, who Paul, he's in, the character of Apollos is in the book of Acts. Um, he needs to be instructed in the book of Acts. Paul also says he does watering. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians, he says what? I, I planted, Apollos watered. So some scholars think it is Apollos. There's others. There's a, do you know any, you have any other theories besides mine? Well, here's what we do know about. Here's, so if we go to the end of 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews, um, at, the end of, at the very, 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 very end of the letter, we do read this. He says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been set free, and if he comes in time, he will be with me when I see you. Greet those from Italy. So you learn two things right here about the author. Two things. Number one, he knows Timothy, and he's friends with Timothy. Okay, that's number one. What's the second thing? What, you guys, uh, he's, familiar, he's familiar with people from a, from a particular region. From Italy. So he knows Timothy, and he's, from, he's familiar, at least acquainted with the people from Italy. So my theory is that in 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter, we know that Paul was martyred and beheaded where? In Rome. He was beheaded in Rome, and one of the last things he says is what? The, he names one person. He says, only this person is with me when he was nearing the end of his life. And who is that person? Only Luke is with me, he says. And so some scholars think that the Gospel of Luke, a lot of them think it was written in Antioch, but some scholars think the Gospel of Luke was written in Rome. After, uh, approaching maybe even before Paul's martyrdom. And so now this starts to make a little bit of sense. We know that uh, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy that only Luke is with me in Rome. He's telling Timothy. So now we know that there's a Luke and Timothy connection. And that also whoever wrote this letter is very familiar with churches in Italy. Correct. So I think this is Luke. Now, I don't, I'm not definitive on that uh, because it's, it's very hard to be definitive when an author doesn't give his name. But, I mean, there's some circumstantial evidence there that I think adds up. And the, the, the internal evidence of the letter indicates that this is an extremely educated person, whoever's writing this. Um, I've often told you that when you look at the original Greek texts of the New Testament, the Gospel of John, even though it's theologically the richest, is very simple Greek. A first-year Greek student could go through the Gospel of John and give a rough translation. As a matter of fact, that's what we did in, uh, in college, in first-year first year Greek at PLU. We translated the Gospel of John. And, you know, there's terms you don't know in your first year, but generally speaking, it's pretty simple, basic Greek. When you come to the Gospel of Luke and that, that type of Greek, uh, it's very ornate. There's lots of what's called, scholars called hapax legomena in Luke. Words that only occur one time in the New Testament. Here, I'll write that up for you because it's kind of a, it's kind of a fun thing to say so you could sound smart. Uh, it's Latin. Hapax legomena, a, a, a one-off, a one-time a one one word that you find nowhere else in the New Testament. You'll find a lot of those in Luke. You'll find a lot of them in Hebrews. So it's very difficult to, difficult to translate, but it's very educated Greek. Paul's also is very educated Greek, but you could tell when you read Hebrews that just as if I, I, I took one of your, a letter that you, you had written and I compare it 
to others' letters that you have written, maybe even if it's years apart, there would be differences, but not like, certainly you could tell if it's a completely 180 degree different writing style. And furthermore, uh, the author doesn't identify himself. So what, I, I, I personally think that this was Luke. Yeah. The, ter the terminology, they use a lot of similar terminology. Mm -hmm. It could also be, but again, Paul usually identifies himself. It could also be that Paul was using an amanuasis, which was a secretary. But, you know, often secretaries like in Romans, Tertius identifies himself that he's a secretary, but it, it, was, it was common for like, people to use a secretary, they would dictate and the secretary would write. Um, but that's as much as we know about the, the, the other thing, Daniel, the other point is, is that the theology of, the theological emphasis of Hebrews is very similar to the theological emphasis of Luke. And so you'll see a lot of, and we know that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul. And so you're, you could, in my mind, you could build a decent case here. So, what was the context? What, do you remember when we first began a couple weeks ago, we said people wrote letters for reasons, that they didn't just write to say hi. So what is this author writing? And why is it, anyone have a guess why it's called Hebrews? No, probably not. Doc, you have to have a theory on that, why it's called Hebrews. I mean, Galatia, Galatians make sense. It's Galatia. Ephesians make sense. It's Ephesus. Hebrews. That doesn't really make sense. It's to Hebrew people. That would be your natural thinking. Um, no, I, I, a lot of scholars think that it has to do with, in this book, the author, the writer, let's just say he's Luke, has a lot of recounting of Old Testament prophecy. <laughs> And Old Testament narrative, you know, when, you, when we get to Hebrews 12, or 11 and 12, he basically retells the whole history of salvation, beginning with like Abraham and even before that with Noah. And I mean, he tells the whole his, so history of the Hebrews. So it could be that the reason it has its name, we only know that from the manuscript tradition that it, that name is attached to it called Hebrews. So that's the reason why. Yeah, Sari? Sounds kind of like Galatia. Um, a, sort of a side note to what you just said. So remember, people didn't write letters just for fun. So one of the things that you're going to see why he's writing this letter is very, very interesting. Do you remember First Peter? Why Peter was writing? You remember, what, this is our, was our first class. What was the central theme of First Peter? Anyone recall? I must have been really interesting that day. Huh? It was suffering, persecution. Do you remember? So in many ways, we should have done Hebrews right after 1 Peter. Because for the, the audience that Peter was writing to, there was an extreme persecution. And when you come under suffering, you tend to question whether or not God is good, God has blessed you, whether or not your faith is right, or your faith is correct, or you're praying right, you start to doubt and question all these sorts of things. Basically, it boils down to when life sucks, uh, is God still good? And the people in First Peter, their life sucked. And Peter is basically, this is a very, very, very high academic theological term I'm using, suck. Um, Peter is saying that Following Jesus Christ and the suck go together. I mean, and you'll see this in, in the gospel accounts in particular. Jesus does not promise ease and comfort and happy meals and, you know, Sundays at McDonald's. He promises suffering. Jesus even said in the gospel of John, I've told you beforehand that if 
if, if, they, if, if I, your teacher, if your master, if this happened to me, what, do you, what are they gonna do? The student is not above the teacher, right? The pupil is not above their master. So if they did this to me, what are they gonna do to you? He says to the women of Jerusalem, for if they do this to me when the wood is green, what's gonna happen when it's dry? So he promises, he promises suffering, Jesus does. I'll give you another example, not in word, but in, in a story of Jesus' life. It's one of my favorite stories. So the point is, suffering and walking with Christ go together. Um, Martin Luther went so far to even say is that it's a mark that you're truly in a Christian church as if there's suffering. It's a mark of Christianity, an authentic mark. If an alien came down and said, asked you, where could I find a Christian church? You wouldn't point at a building or a steeple. What Luther lists seven things, the word, faith, but in particular, the seventh thing he said, there was going to be suffering. <laughs> yeah, you were going to say? Yeah? We well, have yeah, with Timothy. Is that what you're saying? He was a, he, correct. There you go. In Jesus' life, there, in, there's a real amazing story where they're sailing across the Sea of Galilee and um, there's, a, there's a storm that rises on the sea. And it's kind of fun to study the demographics of the Sea of Galilee and how the wind patterns can pick up like rapidly like that. And the, the disciples who were guys who spent their life on the water became uh, super afraid. Now, I always like to say, if men who made their living on the water are afraid, if it's always like when there's severe turbulence on an airplane, I look at the flight attendants and if they're like going, oh gosh, then you got reason to be afraid, right? The people that make a living flying, if they're scared, it's probably really bad. <laughs> um, my brother tells a story. Uh, Ron was in the Navy. My brother Ron, 30 years, he retired out as an 06 captain. And he did two tours down in Antarctica. I don't know if the Navy still has a base down there, McMurdo, Antarctica, but you have to fly from New Zealand in a C-130 all the way to Antarctica. And it's like a 17 hour flight you think 14 hours is bad, huh? But 17 hours uh, in a C-130, like <laughs> no window. I mean, it's not, it's not United or Alaska or Delta. Um, and he said they were over the Arctic Ocean. Okay, that's, I just don't like it. Now I'm already, I don't like the story. <laughs> just that. And he said, and they just nosedived and they're nosediving, and he goes, oh my gosh, this is it. The plane is nosediving into the ocean from 30,000 feet. And he looked at the loadmaster on the plane, guys who spend their career flying, and he obviously was Catholic because he pulled out his rosary and was going. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's like, holy crap, this is the end. Um, what had happened was they had lost cabin pressure and so they just dove down to get, so they don't need, didn't need to pressurize. But suffice it to say, that would scare the living hell out of you. Um, Jesus' disciples are freaked out that they're going to die, and they've spent their lives on the water. That's how bad the storm is. And, so they, and then you find out that in the middle of this uh, Hurricane Katrina, Jesus is sleeping, which is a whole other sermon. It's like, is God sleeping while my life is ebbing away, while my life is just falling apart, God's asleep. So it's also interesting because it's in Mark 4. Mark, Mark tells us that Jesus was sleeping in the stern on a cushion. There you have that insignificant detail that always goes, the vividness of eyewitness memory. And so they go wake him up and... Uh, he, he goes and I love this. It's just exactly what we've been talking about with God's word. Because you've heard, how many times have you heard me say that God's word is performative? It's not informative, it is that. But it's more than anything, it's performative. When God says, let there be light in Genesis 1, there's light. So my speech is, when we're not giving gospel speech, like tonight, it's, it's informative. God's speech, when he speaks, is, can be informative, but... In, in, in these dire, in these um, stories, often it's performative. Jesus, pick up your mat and go home. The guy 
the paralysis unfolds? What? His Word did it. And when God created, His Word did it. C.S. Lewis picks this up in the Chronicles of Narnia in the prequel called The Magician's Nephew when the kids get to go see how Aslan created Narnia. And they watch it. And you know what Aslan does? They start to hear something. They hear the most beautiful, wonderful song they've ever heard. And they finally trace it and they look and there's Aslan high upon this mountain or this hill and he's singing and the, 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 the trees are coming into existence and the animals are coming into existence and life is starting to come forth from his speech. You see, so Jesus in this storm stands up and he speaks. And do you, anyone remember what he said? Yeah, in, in, in the Greek, it's basically just two words. He just says, basically, um, uh, stop. We say peace, which is, sounds better. Uh, shut up. He says, shut up and stop. I love that. And the text says, immediately. It didn't just die down, just wham! Immediately, nature recognizes the voice of its master and stops. And it went, doesn't it say in the text doc, it went dead calm. Yeah. Yeah. Just like my heart. yeah, which is what happened to them too. And it says, and they were terrified. So I always love to put this analogy together. They were freaked out that they were going to die during the storm. And then after the storm is calmed, they're even more freaked out. <laughs> and they asked the right question. They said, who is this? <laughs> that even the wind, and, that's the perennial, que- that's the oft-repeated question in the Gospel of Mark is, is, who is this? Who is this? They often say this. Who is this that could forgive sins? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Yeah. And they're saying, the storm was the biggest, scariest thing we've ever seen in our life. And that biggest, scariest thing that we've ever seen in our life Mere, takes a knee that quick when Jesus gets up and speaks. That's the, the storm is the strongest thing we've ever seen, and whatever it is we have in the boat with us right now is stronger than that. That's scary. And they were terrified. Before, during the storm, they were freaked out. After the storm was calmed, they're even more afraid. And Jesus turns to them and he says what? Anyone remember? He has words for them then. He turns to them and he says, where's your faith? I don't think, in the original language, he's not chiding them for their unbelief. I mean, that's part of it. He's saying, well, you got to go back to what they said to him when they were freaked out during the storm. They said, Lord, don't you care that we're about to die? Boy, that's been on your lips, I bet, a prayer or two. Don't you care? Don't you care? Don't you care? And he's basically saying, you should know better than that. You should know better than that. It's like when my kids, when they want something, this is when they were younger, and they used to have a toy room, and the toy room literally had a Mount Everest pile of toys. Because Kim and I were both the youngest in our family, so our relatives just threw gifts at our kids, spoiled them rotten. And so they have literally... They had everything that little boys could want. And when Kim and I would say no to them, they would often say, you don't care about us. We never get anything. They would say that. As they're standing with the mountain of toys behind them. You, you never give us anything. And our response is, I mean, you guys have experienced this. Your response should be, you should know better than that. Here's the disciple saying, Lord, don't you care to the one who left heaven, emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, was born in an animal stall, lives a life of poverty and suffering, and dies forsaken by God with the sin weight of the entire, the, the sin weight of the entire world upon his shoulders. And they're asking him, don't you care? Do you see that? How nuts that is? He's saying, where's your faith? In other words, why aren't you getting out and using it on the storm? So when the storms hit, he's saying, why aren't you taking your faith out in me and using it on your storms? In other words, he's saying, my love for you is not incompatible with you going through a storm. 
See, we tend to think if he loves me, I wouldn't go through the storm. And Jesus is saying, my love for you is not incompatible with storms. As a matter of fact, that's where my love shines forth. The, great, the, the brightest and the greatest and the most powerful is in the storm, suffering. We're back. This is 1 Peter. So if that's the context of 1 Peter is endure in the midst of pain and hurt and suffering, that's 1 Peter. Hebrews, it's just the opposite. Check this out. In Hebrews 10, the writer says this. He goes, Luke says this. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering? So su they had gone through suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. It, that could happen to you all for being a Christian in a specific... We're not in the Bible Belt in Washington State. You know, I'd like to say we're almost in the porn belt. We're in the opposite of the Bible Belt. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted this conf confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. This is a great verse. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. So, but what he's referring to here in Hebrews 10, he goes, remember, which means what? It happened earlier. And now... He's saying, you came through suffering, but what's happening now? Now what's the problem? Not that life is so full of suffering, how do we endure? The fact is life is so dull and easy, how do we endure? That the faith is easy. To the point, guys, where they're giving up meeting together as a church. Look at that. And let us consider how we may spur one another onward, on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, that certainly sounds like united, that sounds like American Christianity right there. And Darren, we talked about this. Typically, what happens when, when suffering hits or when difficulty hits or when life gets kind of dull and kind of easy where all you're kind of thinking about is what we're going to do this weekend, typically, the first thing that you give up is meeting together. It becomes just, uh, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So when I was a pastor up in Kent, Washington, there was this uh, family that was very active. I like to say faithful. They were very faithful. And then after like a year, uh, you know, I called them up. I didn't see them. Called them up, emailed. <clears throat> you get the typical response, which some of you have given me. Um, uh, uh, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We need to get back into church. We need to get, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get back. Uh, we got to get the kids and we've, and uh, then nothing, which is typically how it works. I mean, you get everyone vowing to the, vowing to the hills and then nothing happens, right? I saw them in the grocery store not long, uh, so it had been like six months to a year. And we make eye contact in the, in the produce section. Um, and I look and uh, people are always, uh, and this goes both ways. I'm always nervous when I see some of you in the grocery store. What's he buying? Uh, <laughs> especially if I, I mean, you know, if I have a six pack of beer in there, I don't drink, but like if I had a six pack of beer, um, how much is that steak? You know, we pay your salary. You get that kind of BS. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we're paying that Mike Adams too much if he could get ribeyes, you know. Uh, and we make eye contact, and her, her name is, I, I'm not going to tell your name, Susie. Uh, she sees me, and I go, hey, and she looks at me, eyes widen, and she goes, I just said, hey, how's it going? And she looks at me, and she goes, we've been busy! <laughs> it's like, jeez, relax. Right? 
it, just me being there was accusatory law, right? But the problem that in American ministry is the problem of the book of Hebrews is that there's, it's not that there is persecution and suffering, it's usually that there's not, none of it. So I'll tell you a story. When I was at Luther Seminary, Life has become so easy for the Hebrews, the, book, the people in the book of Hebrews, which, by the way, most scholars think is a very urban congregation. So right in the, right in the middle of a big city. And how do we, we don't know what city it is, but we know that this book mentions cities practically more than any other book in the New Testament. So it's a, probably a very metropolitan church. Could be in Rome, who knows, but a big city. Um, and life has become very, very, eh, you know, it's pretty good. We're not suffering. It's not First Peter. It's the opposite. So when I was at seminary, you've heard me tell this story before. There was a Tanzanian exchange student who was at Luther Seminary. Duh, from Tanzania. And his name was uh, Isaac. And Isaac... Uh, what, so the way seminary was structured back then is you would do two years of academic work for your Master's of Divinity. Did you, did you have to do this format, what I did? The two years academic, one year residency, third year academic? No. What, did you, what was the MDiv when you got it? Yeah, the residency wasn't critical. Three years of academic work, though. Academic. Not part-time, full-time academic work. So that was, Luther Seminary was two years academic work, one, one whole year of pastoral residency, like, you know, residency, and then a third year, so four years total, and then a third year of academic work. Funny enough, side note, usually it's that third year where they have to go into a church. They study for two years, and they're all revved up. I was too. And then you go into a church, and that's typically where most people quit the, the Masters of Divinity program and they don't want to be pastors anymore. Daniel and I were talking about this because they go in and they're like, I'm all revved up for Jesus. I've got my, my Bible. I'm ready to do Bible studies. I'm ready to go out and, you know, preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you go into a church and you're like, this is not anything like that and nothing of what I actually signed up for. This is, this is stupid. The yeah, and, and that's what most people fall out because like, what, how was your internship? We all would get together afterwards and they're like, well, we, we, uh, we had this big church split. You'll hear this. I'd be like, really? Uh, was it over uh, the doctrine of the Trinity? Uh, justification by faith alone? They're like, no, no. It was the color of the pew Bibles that everyone, some wanted green covers and we went for burgundy and Half the church left and said, to, "You're all. the rest of you are going to hell and we're going to another church now because of this. It's not really God's word if it's not burgundy. And so we're, we're out of here. Stupid crap like that. So when I got back, uh, I had a conversation with Isaac from Tanzania. And he says, I can't do a Tanzanian accent, but it's by Kenya. Isn't it? Is it south of Kenya or north of Kenya? Lydia? It's south of Kenya, Tanzania is. So uh, Lydia is from Kenya. And so Isaac said to me, <laughs> he goes, so Dan, how many baptisms did you do on internship, on your residency? And I said, uh, three. And he goes, oh, oh, that's, and you still want to stick with being a pastor. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm very, you have a lot of perseverance, Dan, to have so little results. You put forth a lot of work and have so little results for it. I'm very, that's wonderful. And I went, well, screw you, Isaac. I, uh, uh, <laughs> that's my mindset, right? I get a little feisty. I said, well, how many, how many baptisms did you do your last year of pastoral ministry? And he goes, and he didn't say it boasting. He said it, he goes, well, we were doing about 75 a month. He goes, then after the persecutions hit, we were doing 150 baptisms a month. We had to have like 10 pastors to do baptisms because 
it would wear us, doing all the baptisms wore us out. And I, but I noticed when he said after the persecution hit, it, the church even, it, it grew fa- faster. And I thought, wow, that is not America. We're the book of Hebrews. He was in 1 Peter. Isaac was in 1 Peter. I'm in Hebrews. And it's kind of a letdown. I've, I've just kind of depressed myself. Uh, it, it is kind of a letdown. But I'm not talking about you folks. I mean, I'm kind of complaining about the folks that aren't here. You know, it's one of the first things you learn about coaching sports is don't yell at the people who are committed and who are there. Um, but nonetheless, you're here. So, But look at they'd given up coming to, going to church together. This was an important verse for me during COVID too. Because for the first time in the history of the United States, for the first time in the history of the United States, the government told churches that they can't meet. That's never happened before. Isn't that wild? I mean, a First Amendment right that was just uh, not even biblically. This This is greater than the First Amendment. But still, there's the First Amendment to the Constitution. I get how you could miss the, maybe the 20... Third Amendment, the 24th. The first one's hard to miss because it's the first one. Um, and they just took it away like that. First time in history that they quarantined the healthy people. Yeah, Russ is a physician. He makes a good point. It's the first time we've ever quarantined people who were healthy. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of illogical stuff that we had to go through. That was a little bit more like First Peter. But We're back into Hebrews now. Anything pop up? Do you guys think uh, any observations? Or is this this sounding familiar, what I'm talking about? Um, You know, and I think it behooves like faith that trains pastors to let them know. It's like you're going into and you're probably going into something that you didn't anticipate. You know, you're you're not... You're not... in, in America, the front lines are fighting that. The problem is that we think is that we need to just spice up the law a little bit more and get a little bit more hardcore to get to, to, to sort of spike people out of their complacency. I've done that. I did that for 10 years. It doesn't work. Yes, sir. So what would you say, like, a, and this is a whole big issue, but like, how would you, what would you say is a remedy on a personal level that you can't self inflict? No. <laughs> the monks tried to do that. Uh, go read the Scarlet Letter. How many of you read that? Were forced to read that book in high school <laughs> by, by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Reverend Dimsdale, remember, would self-flagellate for what he did with Hester Prynne, and he kept it quiet. Um, that's that's what the letter's for. So let's let's dive in. I mean, you've already got part of it, but. Here's a further emphasis on what's going on with them, too. They've given up meeting together, and the author tells them, we don't want you to become lazy, uh, soft. Um, yeah, just apathetic. I bet you guys could give some, some testimony to this, perhaps, maybe not, well, with periods in your own life, but also maybe with people in your family. Um, it's just the, the, the world gets a hold of you, you know, and, and you don't realize the world has gotten a hold of you when it's getting a hold of you. That's part of the problem. Kierkegaard wrote a great book on this called The Sickness Unto Death, is that there's, a, there's an ignorance of the thing. You're ignorant of what's killing you. So we don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So let's begin. Look at so. I, I, I thought this would be a good way to summarize the whole letter. Hebrews is a letter for those who are in it for the long haul. So it's, 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 not, uh, it's not a sprint. What is it? I mean, you're marathoning now. You're, you're in this, you're in with Jesus for, uh, it's, it's more of a marriage now. It's an I do and it's going to go on for 50 years. And for those of you who've been married for a long time, you know that at times, maybe more often times than not, it's, it could be a grind. 
I mean, a real grind. Jim Nestigan always used to say, what do you expect when you put two sinners belly to belly together for a lifetime? And you don't think you're going to get sparks? <laughs> it's not, it's not, uh, it, you don't get perfect wife, perfect husband, perfect life. You get sinners, sinner, put them together, <laughs> stuff happens. <laughs> but it, for the long haul, and that's a tough word to hear. Because we're, we're in a quick fix culture. Um, one of the characteristics, I was talking with a group of teenagers this past Sunday, and I was trying to give them a couple of characteristics of our culture, which, is very, which, which you'll find in Hebrews too, is the fact, well, a lot of this you won't find in Hebrews because it's pretty new with our culture, is um, our, our culture has, uh, see, 100 years ago, if you were growing up, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, <laughs> Uh, traditional culture is what? Traditional culture tells you that in order to become the real you, you have to adhere to uh, your parents, you have to adhere to your parents' expectations or your school's expectations or your community's expectations. In other words, the individual had to sublimate their desires for the greater good of the community. That's why you'd see uh, if your dad was a, 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 you know, if your dad was a, a farmer and had a farm, the son, you're taking over the farm. You're going to carry on the family business. And to, and to you, you, you hear about these stories, there's novels and movies. For the son not to do that, it's extremely insulting to the family. And so traditional culture is more geared toward you have to kind of empty your dreams and desires and you, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's not about you achieving an identity that you want, it's more about you getting rid of the identity you want so that you could be named by the family or named by the, 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 the culture, the community. They're the ones that give you your true identity. We've reversed it in the United States and Western culture as a whole. We're now more... Uh, doesn't matter what my parents want or, and there's some elements of, of individuality that are good, New Testament like in this, but the way we've used it is really bad. That, that it doesn't matter what my parents want, it doesn't matter what my coaches want or my teachers want or mom wants, I have to be me. And kids today are told that you are what you feel. You see what I'm saying? And so uh, you'll find this in, I talked Sunday about to this group of kids, uh, and you know, and their eyes kind of, when you do cultural analysis, they're kind of like uh, tired. And um, so I used to think, think of, uh, this has been going on for like 30, 40 years, this hyper intensity on the individual feelings as your true identity. Uh, uh, climb every mountain. Ford every stream. How does it go? Follow all your rainbows until you reach your dream or something like that. In other words, that's, that's uh, what's, what's, uh, that's Sound of Music. Sound of music. Um, what, what is uh, uh, her name in that? Uh, Julie Andrews' name. What's her name in that? Maria. Maria, yeah. So she's a, she's a nun. And she has to, the hero now is one who, discards the community's expectations for their life and they have to be them, right? Sound of music. A uh, little bit more modern. Uh, it's time to see what I can do. <laughs> uh, no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free, let it go, let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go, right? And that's Elsa. She has to embrace her frozen side. And in the process, she has to be herself. She almost kills everyone in the whole community because they freeze. But it doesn't matter if everyone else suffers as long as you can be you. I'm, this is what our, our kids are being inundated with. Uh, Fantastic Beast, J.K. Rowling. There's a big black cloud. It's magic, Harry Potter type stuff. Do you remember the name of the cloud called the Obscurist? 
and this black cloud that torments people, this cloud of darkness and evil torments people, and it grows in strength whenever there's a witch or a warlock that suppresses their magic powers to not be who they really are. And the cloud then grows stronger and it, 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 it damage is inflicted upon society because they're not being them. So, and this is real interesting. So you are your feelings, but as a consequence of that, when you say you are your feelings, um, whenever anyone disagrees with you, you go into complete meltdown. Why? Because they're not dis just disagreeing with uh, an opinion you have, they're disagreeing with your identity. Because if you are what you feel, that's not just an opinion, it's an identity. And so the identity is extremely fragile and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's extremely, uh, always feels like it's under attack. when they're, It's not a disagreement, it's an attack. You see, and you're starting to see, now you're starting to see why there's such divisiveness in our country. And, it, and you say, we shouldn't study philosophy, we shouldn't study theology. Deep down, it's a philosophical, theological issue here is what's causing this, this rift. Um, and of course, uh, relationships are with current cultures are extremely fragile because relationships are, 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 you get into relationships based upon what you can get, based upon how it makes you, yeah. yeah. And see, so when that person, especially like let's say a marriage doesn't make you happy anymore, you go get a new one so that you could be happy. You see, and this is, this is, this, and of course, there can't be just one true religion because there's people that, there's people that feel differently about faith. So there can't be just one true religion because that would be uh, condemning on the way people feel. I mean, when you look at it the way I just presented it, there's no wonder when you go, when you re look at the news or you, you, you read about how people are kind of at each other's throats, there's, there's, there's no wonder. Why? You know, I mean, cast off the community, cast off the parents' expectations, cast off the country that you're in, right? And just do what you feel like is true and makes you happy. And usually we call this justice, which is why you, you see all these uh, infantile idiots uh, who uh, are destroying university campuses today even today as I, as I speak, is uh, because they're um, infantile, uh, privileged, uh, mostly white morons is what you're dealing with. Um, and when, you're, when you focus on what you feel and your individual identity is all that matters and your happiness is all that matters, you end up in weird places like taking the side of terrorists, <laughs> like becoming an anti-Semitic uh, bloodthirsty dragon to see Jews die. You end up in weird, bad places. Isn't that, and that's exactly where we are. Think about that. I mean, it's, it's to the point where we have, you know, you have Israel today and you have uh, almost like a, the philosophy of Adolf Hitler at play in the Middle East and we're saying, we're with Hitler. Well, Shalane, you've been studying the book of Esther. That was... Uh, Haman was the first Hitler, right? Wanted to exterminate all the Jews. Not much has changed. Especially they were going through chapter nine where this is in Persia. And in, when they were studying chapter nine, guess who attacked Israel that week? Persia. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> Pers the Persians attacked the Hebrews. So anyway, back to our text. At the end of 1322, um, the theme of this letter, look, at there's a word that the author uses here to tell you why he's writing, and he says at the end what? Exhortation. He's, it's a sermon. He's preaching to them to exhort. So let's, let's start how the book begins. We got 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Um, almost Mike Johannine, very John-centered. Uh, but I want you to note, I didn't highlight for you, God spoke by our, th through our forefathers and the prophets, 
but in these last days. What does he mean by last days, you guys? Well, yes, yes, that when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, the end age has begun. It is, uh, it is not the, what, what was Winston Churchill's famous line where after the, the Battle of Britain, what does he say? This is, this is not the end, this is not the beginning, but it is the end of the beginning, right? With the resurrection, is that, was that accurate? Yeah. Is the be- I thought he said it was the end of the beginning. We'll, have, we'll fact check it on that. Point is, with Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead, um, it, that is the beginning of the end. It's, we are in the last days. Now, that doesn't mean like, well, the world's going to end. The, the, Jesus, no one knows when the world is going to end. But it's back to, back to this analogy. I always like the, this, uh, this pictorial illustration I always like to give that this is the old, this is the new, and we are living <laughs> in between the ages. And this always explains why there's still suffering. Yep, there's still the old age that's here. There's still suffering, there's still death, there's still pain, there's still loss, there's still hurt. But when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, something happened in this old world. It's not, it's still the old world because you just read your newspaper. But something has happened here. Something has broken into this old world now where it's old, but there's something new happening. And what has happened, go, there's a wonderful uh, biblical scholar, probably one of the top New Testament scholars in the world today named N.T. Wright. And he said the, the, the Hebrew Jewish mindset in the first century AD was that the, the end of time, there, at the end of time, there would be a, a resurrection of everyone. But it's at the end of time and it would be a bodily resurrection. I know you're going to ask, well, what if I'm cremated, blah, blah, blah. You're going to get, it, don't worry about that. God's not going to say, Wow, she was faithful, she trusted in me, she endured, um, she believed my promises. But I guess it's all bets are off now because she got cremated, so I guess, I mean, my hands are tied. Uh, that's stupid. That's why we laugh. It's dumb. Um, right, right, right. If he could speak the universe into existence with his words, um, he could certainly speak a new body existence that that's still you in some sense, in a new body, into existence as well. Um, but what N.T. Wright says is he goes, the, the Jewish eschatology of that first century had no concept. They, the resurrection was at the end. You've tracking with me? They had no concept for a resurrection in the middle of time, which is one of the reasons why we, it's a historical proof that, they, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is because they never would have invented a resurrection in the middle of time. It went against everything that they thought. So something must have happened to reshape thinking that had thought like that for thousands of years. You don't just change something that's been in a, a, a truth for thousands of years unless something equally drastic has occurred to change your thinking, right? Something massive had to occur, like seeing a dead man rise from the dead. That would do it for me, right? What do, what do we say if there's a guy who could predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off? We go with whatever he says. <laughs> He's the boss. He's the, uh, like my son Eli says, he's him. <laughs> but that's the kid way of saying if you're really good in sports, you're just the star. You say he's him. And, I, and Eli and I were talking about this and, uh, back on Easter and about what Jesus rising from the dead meant. And he goes, oh, oh. He, 